have um, uh, experience in, in, in doing the, the cleanup talk. And um, so I, I'll give it uh, uh, what I plan to promise to, to talk about, which probably won't be all that interesting because it, it got a little bit specialized. Uh, but then I, I um, thought I would say something about what I got out of this conference uh, to help uh, stimulate the discussion. So a um, little bit of an overview. This is, um, I think you already know. The history uh, of the subject goes back uh, a long ways. Let me see if I can get this. Yeah. Uh, so about 50 years is for me, anyway. But but the subject is about 10 years more. So, uh, and uh, at the time, early time when the subject started, when graphene was first uh, discovered, there was nobody working in the field. So the work went almost unnoticed. And even the author uh, mostly didn't notice it. I'll make a comment about that. And then we went through all these other topics, uh, uh, intercalation compounds that was discussed a number of times, fullerenes, nanotubes. During this period, we had a lot of people that joined the field. It got very, very exciting, and lots of people came in uh, on the nanotube period in about 1995. And uh, a big community was built up that understood something about linear E versus K. They, of course, didn't have graphene, but they, it was, in their minds, they had graphene. So that was going on in this period. And then uh, the big paper came in 2004, and this field just exploded. And uh, now we have approximately, what is it, a, a, a thousand papers per year? More? 4,000 papers a year? Thank you. <laughs> It's a huge number. Nobody can read so many, or maybe Andre can, but uh, the rest of us uh, probably can't keep up with it. So uh, uh, it's, it's really a challenge. Uh, but it's nice to be, uh, uh, to find, you know, for a person working in a field when you started, there was nothing there, and then we have so much interest. It, it's quite uh, uh, amazing. So um, I, I wanted to uh, uh, focus on the graphene, but I, I'll re refer to uh, uh, a little bit about Raman scattering because that wasn't really discussed. So uh, I'm, that was my topic because I, I'm the only one really talking about that uh, in a more uh, detailed way. So uh, that's what I'll do. So we go back to the Wallace paper, um, and that was 1947. So that was uh, roughly 10 years before I got in into the business. And uh, so when I was a very young researcher, my first independent career uh, thing, I, uh, I was told I couldn't work in what I had been working before, which is superconductivity. So I had to switch fields. And uh, uh, people were doing all kind of magneto optics at that time. And, and I had access to high magnetic fields right where I was working. So that seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, and um, uh, and that, that is uh, the direction I, I, I took. Uh, but everybody was working on semiconductors, and one semiconductor seemed rather similar to another se semiconductor, especially there were three, five compounds, and people weren't making uh, very good two, six compounds yet. So the, the choice was not so great. So I decided that uh, I'd like to do something really different, and I, I, I thought I would uh, do carbon. And uh, I didn't get a whole lot of, lot of support or interest in this. And that was uh, quite all right, because I thought it was interesting. And all you people that are, that are here now, you think it's interesting, too. So you agreed with me. So uh, and the field was set for me at that time to, to enter. Uh, uh, we had a theory from my uh, classmate, uh, Joel McClure. We, we went to graduate school together. And uh, he had worked out the E versus K for uh, graphite, and um, uh, we had it only in 2D for two dimensions by Wallace, and he made it in three dimensions, and I needed it in three dimensions. Uh, that was the paper in 1957, and in 1962, when I uh, sort of entered the, the, uh, the fray, uh, uh, he uh, finished his paper on the magnetic field dependence. So he was just ready for me. And uh, 1960 was also a, a celebrated year because that was the year that HOPG appeared here in London in Imperial College. And so I went to visit Imperial College. I gave a lecture there and told them that they started graphene in a way. 
Uh, so, uh, but that, that, is, that is in fact the case. So I, I was able to get a sample that uh, uh, I could have an orbit, a cyclotron orbit, large enough in the sample so I wasn't getting scattered by the, the boundaries of the sample. So I had a theory and I had a sample, so it was, it was time to get to work. So that's a history. I'm not sure that you all know about that, but that's uh, uh, how I got started in the business. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, because that's what I promised to talk about, was how we use Raman spectroscopy. And uh, as you can see here, there are all kinds of peaks uh, in the spectrum. And I, I, I threw in the, the spectrum for uh, nanotubes so you could see the radial breathing mode because there's been so much written about that in the last 10 years or so, 15 years. Uh, but the main thing for um, uh, graphene is the G-band where the two atoms, carbon atoms, are, are vibrating against each other. And we have um, uh, one layer and then a second layer, and that makes the unit cell, whether you have graphene or graphite, it's almost the same. So there's a great deal of simil similarity between um, uh, graphite and uh, uh, graphene. So, and then there were a few other features. When you go to a conference you, uh, in graphene, you hear about the G band, and then you hear about this G prime band, and I'll talk about it, it's sometimes called the 2D band. The 2D, 2D band is actually something a little different from the G, band, G prime band. I'm not going to get into this because this gets into uh, some difficulties. It takes too much time, and I'm not going to deal with that. Uh, uh, but I would like to speak about some uh, other features. Uh, between the G band and this G prime band, there's um, some scattering. And uh, this M band hasn't been discussed very much. One of uh, my Crami students, Victor Brar, when he was an undergraduate at MIT, actually uh, worked on this thing with me. And, uh, but for this occasion, we, did, we have some more work done with the people from Singapore. Uh, so that's, that's developing. And um, uh, Andrea F uh, Ferrari uh, oops, has um, uh, done something recently uh, on this very low frequency uh, regime um, uh, at less than 50 wave numbers. And I, I don't have his view graphs, and I haven't seen his paper yet. I don't know if it's published. But that's a new, new result that we'll be looking for in the next few months when it gets published because that, that's a new feature in the spectrum that we've been waiting for a, for a long time. So this is, uh, uh, even though this, stuff, this is like uh, many things we heard at this conference, part of this field is quite old, but with the uh, reinvigoration that came with the discovery of uh, single layer graphene, the field was invigorated, and some of these old traditional uh, areas that we've been working on from years for years are now a little different because we started thinking about this much more seriously and we have results that, that we didn't have before. And that will be the, the, the gist of my, my discussion for you today. So a little bit on graphene with a review. So uh, this is uh, the 1962 paper of Burham and I went to a couple of confer conferences and people were uh, questioning uh, whether this was really a correct result. So um, I uh, met um, Hans Peter Boom uh, in 1977 when we had the first intercalation compound conference. And they had a, um, maybe two handfuls of people. It wasn't a very big conference because conferences were very small at that time. There weren't that many people working in physics. Uh, but he was there. And, uh, but he didn't talk about this. Uh, he was talking about. Uh, very early work that he did in intercalation physics. He was one of the pioneers in that area. And from the period that I knew him, uh, in the early 1970s when that field started, until uh, he retired, that he was doing making new materials and a lot of work in intercalation uh, uh, physics. Uh, never once during all that time did he talk about graphene. Uh, but I did talk to him uh, very recently um, like the last half year, and I asked him uh, what he thought about this paper. Uh, he's exactly the same age as I am. Uh, he retired maybe 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and he doesn't travel, but he remembers this paper, and he says he sticks by it. So there you are. 
So it has about the synthesis of a uh, um, uh, single layer graphene, and he has a table that shows something about it. Um, and he believes that he made uh, graphene from graphene oxide, and some other people have been reproducing that work. I wanted to, to pass this on because there were some questions about this work, whether he believed in it, what happened to him, and so forth. Some people don't know this history. Okay, so here's graphene, and uh, we've seen this picture many times. There's not much to, more to say. Two atoms per unit cell. And the B atom could be in this position or it can be in this one or in this. So we have some, some choices, and we could make um, ABC stacks with different uh, configurations. But the AB, AB, AB is the uh, ground state, and that's what we normally have. That's or ordinary. Uh, Brunel uh, graphite. And that's what we have a lot of data on. There's also the ABC version that uh, uh, has been known for many years, but there's almost no data in the literature on that. That's a very uncommon form, and there's very little uh, work that has been done on it. And it's gotten interesting now that we have graphene because we can make these different combinations and maybe may many more uh, from the discussion that we had here. So that opens up another research field that, that we might be thinking about. Okay, so uh, this you've heard, and so we have a uh, uh, single layer, and we have the linear E versus K, and we have bilayer very close to the uh, Dirac point. We have a quadratic form, but when you look away from it, it doesn't look terribly different from this, and except that you have two layers rather than one. Um, uh, and um, I have a little more to say about that. So this is a picture of, of monolayer and graph. Uh, and two layers, and uh, it was discussed numerous times. This is the famous uh, um, paper that I think broke the field open, and after this came, uh, um, it started the 1,000 paper, now we're up to, maybe we'll up, be up to 10,000 by the end of the decade. So uh, anyway, the field took off at, after this point, the uh, quantum Hall effect integer one in graphene. It was different than uh, gallium arsenide, so people got excited. Uh, soon thereafter, uh, uh, there was Raman spectra, and this was also taken by uh, the Manchester group in conjunction with uh, Cambridge. So this is Andre Ferrari's work. And uh, we have known that for a long time that the uh, second order effect, this G prime band, is very large compared to the first order. Usually in physics, the second order effects are second order, and they're small. That's why we call them second order. But we had this material, uh, because of the linear E versus K, you have all K vectors in the Brouin zone resonant, in a, in a sense. So you're always doing triple resonance. Um, and uh, uh, general, for, for graphite, we have a double resonance effect that, that, that's uh, responsible for this G prime process. I'll tell you that a little bit more about that later. But every possibility that you can have for uh, the uh, monolayer is resonant. So it gives you this huge uh, um, signal at the second order effect. Uh, and the bilayer is also quite large, but it's much less than the monolayer. I, I have been waiting, I'll throw this out to people in the audience. I've been waiting for people to consider uh, uh, the, this system as a, a metrology system because it is kind of simple, and in a way, everybody can reproduce it. And we could use, uh, uh, as uh, Philip Kim in his talk was uh, uh, talking about uh, doing the uh, resistivity as a function of temperature uh, and seeing what the power law and, and uh, checking uh, the old formulas that we have going back to uh, ancient times, uh, uh, I believe that it is correct to say that, that until you did it for graphene, nobody checked the, the t to the fifth uh, power. Uh, that occurs uh, in the resistivity. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but uh, if you look at, in Cattell's where he has all these uh, uh, curves superimposed, yes, they're all similar, but they're not t to the fifth. So uh, it's, it's really great that you could uh, show that reason. You did, t you did t to the fifth? 
Oh, okay. But but Cattell's uh, picture is not T to the fifth. Yeah. Okay. All right. You, so you you did that, and I didn't know that. Okay. I apologize to you. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, you know, it's uh, we have to advance the concepts of physics to even if they're boring. So uh, this is the process that that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm happy. I did I did I didn't follow that because I I, I I kind of stopped teaching at at one point. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, I'm going to explain uh, what happens with the uh, uh, G prime band because we'll be using that in the talk. So uh, this is the second order process. A photon comes in, it excites an electron from the conduction band. To the valence from the valence band to the conduction band, leaving a hole behind. So we have an electron hole pair. So that that makes a neutral system. Um, uh, one of the new things that I learned that's just coming up now, but I didn't hear it at this conference. But we're supposed to talk about uh, what's happening in graphene. Is now uh, people are are not only exciting electron and hole, but they make a, an ion charge. So you have two holes and one electron, and they call that a trion, and that has a different spectrum. But I didn't hear anything about that here. I think that's an interesting new development in this field. So anyway, uh, uh, let's go back to this uh, uh, story. So we have the uh, electron excited, hole is left behind, the excited electron gets scattered, um, and it scatters from the K to the K point, which is uh, essentially a, a equivalent point, but except that there's time reversal symmetry between the two, but when it gets to here with the scattering process, it emits a phonon in the Stokes process, so it, it loses a little bit of energy, and then it comes back here, uh, and loses a little bit more energy, and uh, then it recombines. So it, this is a two phonon process. There are no uh, elastic events, uh, as as stated. If, if the elastic events happen as they do in the D band, then this would be 2D. But those elastic event, events, well, they could be there, but that's uh, energetically not favorable. So that's the difference between uh, 2D and G prime, if you really want to be fussy about that. So now we go with different um, uh, photon energies. And uh, so with different photon energies, uh, we'll be having a smaller Q vector, and that means that the phonon will have uh, less energy. So uh, because of that, uh, it, it will be uh, shifted. So you have a, a dispersion relation. G prime is always a, a dispersive feature. And uh, now if I come in with red light um, here, it's even a smaller wave vector. And so you could see that uh, the G prime band has a very large shift. But I'm going to show you some others that have even more shifts uh, later on which is very unusual in second order processes. So the shift here is a uh, 100 wave numbers per EV. That's a very large uh, for Raman scattering. Uh, because of linear E versus K, every one of these processes is resonant because we're going from a real state to another real state. We scatter to a real state. We come back to a real state. And then we recombine to a real state. So everything is real states, and that's the reason for this huge uh, um, intensity. In the Raman effect, you, uh, you often make the transition to a virtual state, and therefore the probabilities are very much reduced. So the, that, that makes this a line shape uh, a very unusual in physics. We don't have. I don't know of any system that's like this. This is a unique system. Uh, so now that was the first order effect. So uh, that's one layer uh, uh, graphene. But now if you have bilayer graphene, and we have a lot of papers in bilayer graphene, so we should say something about that. So uh, the photon uh, can come in and uh, uh, make the excitation I've described before for the G prime process. Uh, from the lowest energy band, that's the this one here, and so that that we go here back and forth, and then we, I call that P11, and uh, the total energy of the two photons phonons that are cr uh, created uh, will be up here. So this is P11. So that's uh, one point for some energy of excitation. Since everything is resonant, we can have any. We have a choice of lots of points to do here, so we can 
uh, populate this whole line. But uh, in, instead of doing the first level, I could do the second level. So here's the starting in the second level, going to the second level, scattering uh, to the second level, everything to back, back and forth, second level. That's P22, and that's over here. But I, I don't have to do that. I can go uh, to the, uh, uh, here I can make a, a transition here to the first, le from the, uh, uh, first level to the second level, and uh, then uh, come back and, um, Oh, I can, this one is from the first level to the first level. Then I go to the second level here and come back on the second level and find myself a hole to go to. And so that makes the cross term P12, et cetera. So that, that's where the, all this comes about. And since the phonon well, it has a different wave vector, it'll have a different energy, and you could separate. It's, it's separated by, by uh, just very uh, few um, uh, uh, small energy, just a couple of uh, millivolts. But you can uh, certainly resolve that. And if you're looking at a whole bundle of, uh, of um, uh, uh, a whole bunch of bilayer, you get a, a spectrum that looks like this. So uh, uh, not the individual peaks are not resolved. The line width is greater, so they overlap, and you get uh, overlap energy. But it has a certain line shape, and that was be what has been one way that people <coughs> have quickly identified this is uh, bilayer and not monolayer. Monolayer has this huge uh, single peak, and this one has uh, a much broader uh, peak. Now I'm going to show you something new, a new feature. So we have yet another thing that we could look at, and then I'll go on to talk about others, other subjects. So this is work done with, uh, in collaboration with a, a, a group of young people in, in um, Singapore. And so they had a sample, and the sample is kind of nice. Maybe it has some uh, uh, deficiencies because it has a lot of different regimes here. But they have a region that's uh, one layer, and they have another region that, that's uh, bilayer, and uh, three, four, et cetera. And they, uh, uh, it's a pretty big sample. It's some microns. So the optical beam can be uh, housed in one of these uh, regions. And uh, so they did a scan to find out what's in the sample, and then they came back. Uh, doing the kind of thing that you've heard here several times of, of uh, seeing what the absorption is at different spots. You can sort of uh, monitor where you are. And uh, what, what we do in these, these kinds of samples, we put a fiducial marks uh, uh, on the uh, um, uh, substrate, so we can always come back to exactly the same place on the sample and repeat and do the spectrum repeatedly uh, on the same point. So that's the way the experiment is done. And um, so uh, and this is uh, uh, usual, you know this. Uh, so this is the G band, it's discussed many times, and that's G prime. I discussed that as well. And in, 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 in single layer, it's very, very big. And then we have another region in here that you don't see a whole lot. Uh, but if you are very persistent and you look in here, uh, you can uh, identify Victor Brar's uh, 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 M bands. Uh, I think Michael Crummy will be happy to see his students' M bands. Uh, and and then, uh, then I'll show you all the stuff we missed because we didn't uh, maybe spend enough time looking for all these other little features. So this is the place that we're going to look now. And uh, so this is the region um, here between roughly uh, 1750 wave numbers and uh, uh, 2100, 2200, uh, uh, where there are other features. If you look carefully and spend a lot of time looking, you will see more things. So um, the first part I'm going to show you is uh, what happens between 1700 and 1800. And uh, uh, this is a region of the spectrum that we had studied before with Victor Brar. And uh, at that time, we identified two regions, M minus and M plus. And we, when you look at this, we saw this looking like a, a letter M. Can you see something that looks a little bit like? We thought it looked like letter M, so we call that the M band. We didn't have M band in, in graphene so, uh, before, so that's what we called it. Uh, but then when you look at it a little bit more carefully, uh, uh, you notice that this has um, a, a, a non-Lorentzian line shape, 
And this one is mostly Lorenzian, but this one has a weird line shape. And uh, if you look at all the places in the sample uh, uh, from the thickness measurements, et cetera, uh, there is no signal whatsoever for uh, the monolayer. It's absent. And uh, you begin to get something in the bilayer, and um, then you get some more. And if you sort of look at the features, well, this is maybe the most interesting, so you have maybe three features. And if you think about this as three Lorentzians and you apply that to the whole series, then you get something that I'm going to show you in the next view graph. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a, a results for what happens in this region <coughs> where the M band occurs, and that one we knew something about. But then I'm going to show you something about this region that we, that as far as I know, know, nobody has studied before. And maybe we should go back and look at all different kinds of regions because maybe there are more things like this that we've missed because we haven't looked carefully enough. So uh, uh, I guess last night we had a, a, a philosophical discussion about science. Uh, I, some of you were, were present. And uh, somebody was criticizing the science community that we don't do careful work. And I, I, I think that in defense of the science community, I think that, that the first thing that you do when you do science is you do uh, uh, what, what's apparent and what's easy and accessible and you have a chance of understanding it. And then, um, then maybe something gets more interesting and you come back and, and see if there's maybe more to it. And I think that the uh, R to the fifth uh, dependence of the low temperature resistivity is maybe something in that uh, department that we wanted to get it right and it was wrong for many years. And, um, and I think there are a number of other things that, that came up at this conference that are also in this category that people call boring, but they've been wrong in the, not quite right in the literature for a long time. And now with graphene, we can straighten them out. So I think that we should say that that's a positive thing that we can do. We'd like to have everything right. And uh, sometimes getting everything is right is difficult. But if now we have material that is, is enabled, Maybe we should go ahead and do it. Okay, end of, of philosophical comments from last night. Uh, uh, well, I think as the last speaker, and uh, I was told I was supposed to summarize what we learned at this conference, and that was one thing I learned from the conference, is that the people in the UK like to have philosophical conversations. <laughs> so so uh, and now, now, now I am here uh, uh, talking about the M band, and I'm going to show you in a view, few view graphs uh, how we did a, a little more careful study of the M bands. So one layer has nothing, so it doesn't appear here. It's absent. So now we have to have a theory to explain that why there's no M band uh, in uh, monolayer graphene. But in bilayer graphene, because uh, looking at all the different uh, number of layers, uh, you have the idea that the um, uh, lowest term here, uh, this one here, should be uh, a doublet. So, and he's, you uh, 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 identify it as a doublet, it works rather well, and then you could uh, follow all the components. And uh, so then we have the second part of the doublet, and then we have this uh, piece here. And uh, usually, when we do these kinds of um, uh, uh, things, uh, we like to identify which phonons are involved. And the frequency for, the, for the, uh, two out of these three uh, work rather well with the M band, which is uh, um, identified with uh, this phonon. So you see that there are three uh, acoustic phonons and three optical phonons. And there are two atoms per unit cell, so that all makes sense, right? That's elementary boring physics, but we have to keep track of those things to make it right. And um, uh, the outer plane, um, a very soft uh, mode that comes in the C direction, we know almost nothing about. So even though it's boring, it's uh, kind of interesting. And um, so we had some uh, new insights uh, about that uh, uh, feature from uh, Andre Ferrari. At, uh, but he's not here uh, to give that talk, so, uh, and I don't have his data, so uh, that's coming up, and we'll read the uh, physical review or, or Nature or ACS Nano Letters. I don't know where he's going to publish that. But um, uh, 
that, that is the uh, analog of uh, what happens uh, with the uh, GBAM. So anyway, uh, uh, the uh, identification of this is twice this mode. So this mode comes roughly at 900, and, uh, but a little bit less, like 970, uh, uh, 870. Uh, that's a known mode. It's IR active. So we know that. It, we don't know from Raman spectroscopy because it's Raman forbidden. But it, it, it can show up if you have some kind of uh, uh, disorder or, or edge states or something. And uh, it's a very weak feature. I was saying you have to really work at it to see, bring it out. So uh, and uh, so th that's that that's the M band. And these two uh, work with uh, a combination of, of um, uh, the twice the M band. Um, uh, one for intra-valley scattering and the other one for inter-valley scattering. So intra-valley scattering, instead of going from K to K prime, you just stay on the same K or the same K prime, but you don't go between the valleys. And it takes less uh, energy to do that. So they're a little bit shifted from each other. And uh, that all works out in the energetics of it. Uh, and then we have another mode here, and uh, so we made an identification of what that could be. And um, so of the two uh, TO modes that we have. But uh, then we have uh, uh, a combination mode that we're going to identify with this lower frequency mode. So yeah, so the, uh, what's uh, clicking for you is the OTO, and that's the infrared active mode. That's made um, uh, a Raman active by having the small feature and probably some defects. So we have a symmetric and an anti-symmetric combination of the two uh, 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 vibrations. Uh, the vibrations are the same with respect to each other in, within the plane, but across the plane, they have opposite phase, and uh, that's shown on the top here, and that op opposite phase introduces larger Q vectors, and that's why we have small frequency shift. So that's the explanation of that piece. Let's see what we have, and okay. So uh, uh, the other, the three uh, uh, bits that we have here are the, uh, uh, the TO modes, um, the two of them, and then we have another piece that I'm going to bring in in a little while, and that's this one here. That's uh, a lowest one, LO plus ZA, and this is the frequency, the laser energy. And where all these pictures were taken. So that will give you the identification of what it is, LO plus ZA. And now moving along here, let's see. Okay, now I'm going to go to the next little bit, which goes from um, um, 1850 or so to uh, um, 2100. And uh, now I, we can have something happening for the uh, uh, monolayer. You see there's some peaks, and so what are they all about? And uh, you can follow those peaks. They, they go for, uh, not only for HOPG, you have them, uh, but uh, you have them very nicely uh, for monolayer. It's very much more helpful than HOPG. Uh, uh, and then, then you get um, what happens here as you go up, up the trail. And um, uh, so now we have to do some identification of what these things might be. You see that they're all dispersive, and then, but there's, some of them are a little bit asymmetric, and you have to find some kind of identification what they are. So here are some possibilities that we came up with. Um, so we have three different uh, uh, possibilities here, uh, and I hope we have some, yes, we have some names for them. Um, and so here's combination mode that works in frequency very nicely for this. So the ITA is, is uh, uh, this one here. That's the ITA. This is the outer plane uh, mode and, um, and then LA and TA. And then we make combinations with these guys, LO and, um, and TO. Uh, ITO is the in-plane optical. Uh, uh, that's 1580. That's the one you know very well. G-band is what we call that. And um, 
so here are three, and then we had three from the uh, uh, from 1700 to 1800, and I believe I have all the identifications. There are four identifications for the higher frequencies and three for the lower, so there are seven altogether. And uh, there's, there's another group in Clemson University that's done something very much like that. And they also have the same uh, uh, identification independently and for the same group of, of, uh, of uh, features. So if you um, uh, sum, sum up uh, uh, the story, you have, there are a bunch of, uh, of wiggles here, and um, they vary as the a sample changes. You go from one layer to seven layers. There's some small difference that hasn't been worked out in detail yet, but you see that what where we're headed here. And there are some that uh, show, say, this feature here, uh, this M-band feature, and there are others that uh, require um, uh, uh, that we have to go to two-layer, bilayer, single layer, doesn't have it. And if the two layers are incommensurate, you don't have it either. So you have to have A, B stacking uh, and more than one layer. So that's what we've learned. Those are new results. And um, I don't know how interesting you are, interested you are in this, but I, I think that what we're going to see as a result of our discussion last night, plus other things happening in the field, uh, that, that uh, people will clean up all these little features. There are a whole bunch of features. There are combination modes of this sort. When, uh, when we were studying uh, fullerenes, uh, we had 20, 200 combination modes to put together. And, you know, you have a C60 molecule, you have a huge amount of symmetry, and they all seem to combine. And uh, some were infrared active, some were Raman active. Uh, that didn't have much broken symmetry because the fullerenes are really very robust molecules. But here we can have vacancies, as we found out, and other kind of distractions. So this is to show you that the, how the M-band is a new thing, and we have to do more theory with that. OK, a little bit now going back to nanotubes. Nanotubes are different from graphene. And they, uh, we've been working on nanotubes maybe 10 more years than graphene. And uh, the field is still active. Uh, how come? Uh, maybe that field should have been dead by now, because usually 10 years is enough to uh, exhaust any field. But uh, the problem with nanotubes is, uh, and, and why it's still active, and maybe will stay active for, I don't know, I don't know if 10 years, because we have so many experts now from graphene that when they get tired of working on graphene, they may uh, try to mop up the uh, unfinished work in in nanotubes is very easy for them because the physics is very similar. Uh, uh, but there are many things in nanotubes that are still not understood. And why is that? And I'm going to try to say that because I think it might be interesting to this audience when they do something and they want to see how it is in nanotubes. So a nanotube is a rolled up sheet of, of uh, graphene. And um, we have a single, we can have a single sheet. And it was kind of funny that this whole thing was um, fantasized uh, well before uh, it was ever produced in the laboratory. And uh, maybe it would not have been produced in the laboratory anywhere as quickly if it hadn't been fantasized. And uh, the reason was that uh, um, for various historical reasons I won't go into here, uh, we were uh, into the idea of predicting what the nanotube would be like if we could ever make it as, a, as just a Gadotkin experiment. And the, the prediction was by uh, three groups, uh, and they came out at the same time. It, the papers were uh, published in different journals around the world, different countries, at the same time, uh, uh, predicting that if we ever could make a single wall nanotube, it would be e either semiconducting or metallic. So that was 1992, and uh, the first na uh, single wall nanotubes were made in 1993, about um, half a year, nine months after the 
uh, first papers predicting them, how interesting it would be to make them if we could. So uh, w w what, what's the reason for it? What's the physics behind that? So I'm going to go into that and ex try to explain that. So if you take a, 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 um, a graphene sheet and you roll it up, um, uh, then you have a very few uh, atoms around the sheet, maybe 10. So that means you'll have 10 cutting lines. And so you have the uh, uh, graphene cones like this, but since you don't have all the states uh, uh, available, you only have 10 states to, to uh, uh, manufacture from this, and you have to space these uh, cutting lines uh, appropriately to satisfy quantum mechanics. Uh, it, a, as you put them in, uh, and the geometry that goes into uh, 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 requiring how you put them in, uh, the, a cutting line might cut through this uh, Dirac point, or it might not. So uh, it turns out that one third of the cases will go through the Dirac point, and that will make a metallic nanotube, and the other two thirds of the possible cases will not go through, so we'll have a semiconducting nanotube. And uh, so uh, that's just from the geometry of the triangular lattice. So that was predicted, and uh, um, people didn't believe it, I must say that. And it, it really took uh, until 1998, six years later, after the first papers were written, for people to say, yeah, we can have metallic and semiconducting nanotubes. Most of the people in this audience don't know that history because um, when you join this field, probably, it was all settled and everybody, as soon as the experiment was done, showing that actually in the laboratory we could make them and had spectra, then it was all over. Uh, and so that's what happened starting in 1993. Uh, okay, a anyway, uh, uh, for the nanotubes, we also have this radial breathing mode and uh, so that's where all the atoms uh, in the tube are vibrating in a radial direction. And the frequency uh, depends on, on the diameter. So that becomes uh, identification of the nanotube diameter, and it's been used for that ever since. And uh, uh, also, uh, we can, uh, a little bit more um, indirectly, uh, identify what the NM is by measuring, that is the uh, uh, chirality and uh, both the uh, chiral angle and the diameter of the nanotube, just from this frequency and the theory behind it. Then we have uh, uh, the longitudinal vibration associated with the G-band and it has a transverse component, we mentioned that already. And then we have the second order feature, G-prime, that I already mentioned. And then we have this M band that's new and we're just learning about it. And then we have this disorder induced band here that uh, shouldn't happen, uh, but if you break symmetry, so we have a lot of symmetry breaking discussion at this conference, and that's one of the features, and one of the early features that we used in carbon science to study uh, 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 disorder, breakdown of symmetry. We're getting more sophisticated, and I think in the last year, uh, one of the things that I'm seeing is that we don't, we're not just satisfying that saying that we have a defect, but we want to know if it's a vacancy, if it's a die vacancy, how, it, how the die vacancy is ordered, if we have an edge. An edge is a discontinuity in the infinite lattice, so that, that could be treated as a def defect, and it, it produces a discontinuity, and we can pick that up. So the um, uh, radial breathing mode is here, uh, and you see it's at different frequencies, and uh, that indicates that we have a different nanotube that's in resonance with a different diameter, so therefore a different frequency, and then we can get the NM values. So up there, are, there are many ways now. There's Rayleigh scattering and, and um, other, other ways to uh, determine NM, and uh, I think the interesting thing that I've been picking up uh, uh, right this year, and it's pretty new, is uh, uh, many labs are now doing multiple experiments uh, to uh, correlate uh, 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 information, either on structure, on electronic properties, optical properties, magnetic properties, whatever. And uh, uh, it used to be that, that when you published a paper, you would have one uh, uh, technique 
But now, at, uh, some of the really interesting work that I heard uh, at, at, in the Bordeaux conference before coming here was of this dual, two different kind of techniques. So I, I throw this out to you because not many people from this conference were also there, but um, I was. So I summarize a few things at this conference that I learned from them there. So uh, the er earliest work like here was done on bundles of, of tubes. And uh, so uh, with bundles, you just get an ensemble information. Uh, that's the earliest work that we did, this very first paper, a historical one on first Raman in nanotubes, was 1997, and that was done on bundles. But it became obvious uh, uh, right after th this experiment, we did another experiment to show that the spectrum looked very different from metallic than semiconducting tubes. And that meant that we really had to do this at the single nanotube level to be able to, uh, uh, in detail, understand uh, what, what went with what. So uh, this uh, picture on the right is spectroscopy taken only on one tube. And so we have one um, uh, semiconducting tube, and that's this one, and one metallic tube. That's over here. So uh, this is the first paper on, on single wall uh, uh, spectroscopy in the nanotube uh, department. But now people doing it with, with many other um, uh, kind of techniques. It's not only Raman, it's many other things. So uh, what's Raman spectroscopy good for? So this uh, uh, picture uh, has a lot of people's work, and it shows it allows you to di di distinguish between different kinds of carbon. So this is just uh, maybe a little, um, not everybody realizes that diamond and graphite have very different spectra. So there they are. You can see frequencies are totally different, but they're all carbon. So sp square bonds and spq bonds, they have different separations, and they have different coupling. You know, one is, uh, is planar bonds, and the other one is tetrahedral bonds. So uh, it's obvious that they'll be very different, and so you see different spectra. But not only that, uh, when you have different kinds of sp squared, so this is graphite, and met, uh, this is a uh, single wall nanotube, and amorphous carbon, and everything looks very different. And that has to do with um, um, defects and you know, many other uh, issues. So we can use um, uh, Raman spectroscopy to uh, uh, take other allotropic forms. Uh, a C12 and C13 that came up at this conference, uh, yeah, they, 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 you can tell them very, very well by Raman spectroscopy because um, um, the vibrational frequency of almost everything will depend on the mass of the atom. And uh, C12 has a very different mass, and it's almost 10% different from C13. So it'll be way separated, and you can uh, distinguish. So some of the experiments people were talking about here would be relatively easy to do. And um, there's one uh, paper that we recently published, but I don't have the view graphs for it, uh, where one layer is C12, at, at, that's on a substrate, and, um, and then we have another one that's C13, that's, that's, well, it's actually the other way around. The C13 is on the substrate, and the C12 is deposited on top. And uh, we, can see, sub, we can study substrate effects directly because one of them has a different, it, they show up differently in the spectrum, but the interaction is almost the same. So um, that, uh, those kinds of experiments I throw out to you as, as being very uh, relatively easy to do nowadays. It's easy to get isotopes, and they give you a lot of information. So uh, that, that's an addenda to this. Uh, um, and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, modes are dispersive, and that, that's what I have here to show you that uh, uh, you can do studies here as a function of, thing, of, of issues like, like um, uh, size of, of a domain, and uh, that changes the amount of D-band that you have. Or th you could just do uh, experiments to see what the dispersion is uh, to study where, what the wave vectors are. Because with Raman effect, uh, you could measure phonons, and the phonons will be different in a second order process depending on what the photon energy is. So uh, uh, that's one thing that you can do easily. Uh, and this one I, uh, I threw in here to show you that you could study uh, issues like doping. So if you have an undoped sample, uh, um, you get one kind of spectrum, a p-dope sample, and um, uh, 
Uh, so the top one here is undoped, and then you have uh, endoped and p-doped. So the endoped uh, uh, pushes the frequencies down to lower frequencies, and the end a uh, p-dope pushes uh, the frequencies up to higher frequencies. Same thing happens in intercalation compounds. So this is sort of general throughout the uh, uh, carbon literature. So if you know that, you can do a lot of things. You could study pressure dependence, and you could see here for different amounts of uh, applied pressure, you get shifts. And so this is uh, part of, uh, uh, so this is uh, uniform uh, uh, squeezing. We had uh, stretching mostly in, 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 the, in the talks. You could do stretching here too, and that gives you something similar. Uh, temperature effects, that's another thing. These frequencies, you change the separation by a little bit of the carbon-carbon distance, not very much is necessary, and you get big changes that you could see in the spectrum. So temperature-dependent phenomenon could be measured. You could measure equilibrium or lack of equilibrium between electrons and holes because you could probe the phonons and then probe, probe the electrons at the same time. The elect electrons come in in terms of the wave vectors that are chosen, and the phonons come in by the phonon frequency. So you, on this very same shot, you can study electron-phonon interaction in this kind of way. And then we have edges. Edges uh, represent a breakdown of symmetry. So uh, uh, group theory and symmetry tells you that if you're an internal point here, um, uh, th there should be no reason to have a you know, sort of infinite lattice, so you'd have no D-band, no disorder-induced band. But if you come over here uh, close to um, uh, an edge, this is an armchair edge, which we found out by doing Raman, you know, then you get a big D-band si signal. But symmetry tells you that the uh, uh, zigzag edge should have a, has a vanishing matrix element. So if, if the sample had been a really good sample, with a perfect edge with no defects, uh, then this um, uh, signal here should have vanished. Well, it's pretty small, so that's the best at that time. This is pretty old work. It's seven years old, and we make better edges now, but that's just to show you an idea about edges, how you could study them. So this is do doping and defects, so if you add more um, a quantity of a dopant, uh, you broaden the lines. So that's what's shown here. And uh, then um, this is, well, donor and acceptors. This is mostly what I put together here to show you that um, uh, doping and defect um, can be studied. And uh, this is now size of samples, domain size. Grain boundaries, we saw a wonderful picture from uh, uh, Cornell. I think that was showing an individual grain boundary. We saw five, seven defects along the grain boundary, uh, uh, the boundary of the grain between two two grains. I, I, I think was was it you, Philip, that showed that? Um, we saw that this today. Um, somebody own up. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Hong, from uh, Korea, showed that. But I think, believe that picture was taken at Cornell. Was that right? Yeah, that that's the one I know. Uh, that's a very beautiful picture. And so that shows us that we could understand what happens at the grain boundaries. And now we, we know exactly. So the, just a whole series of stone whale defects along the grain boundary. It's really a very beautiful. Maybe we'll bring that again uh, if anybody's interested in seeing that. I think we can learn a lot from that. Um, and this is something new. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's submitted but not published. Uh, and this is electronic uh, uh, spin resonance, uh, not spin resonance, ele electronic Raman scattering. Um, uh, so what, what is this effect? Uh, this effect has been seen in other systems, but this is the first time it's been seen in the carbon system. So a photon comes in, makes a, an electron-hole pair. Uh, electron-hole pair can be generated for uh, any different kind of wave vector. So that, that's the reason that you have this very broad band. It can be seen <coughs> if you have a, a rather pure sample uh, so that the Fermi level goes here because you have to go from an occupied state to an unoccupied state to excite this system. So if you uh, dope the system, uh, you'll kill this, this transition because this is not that many 
MEVs, so uh, uh, you can quench it with um, moving the um, Fermi level. Uh, this is observed for metallic tubes, not for semiconducting tubes, so it's, it's unique to that. Uh, that's the prediction, and that's the observation. So uh, that's a new, new topic. Um, double wall tubes. Uh, I'm going to say something about that. Uh, this is sort of, uh, to me, a little bit analog analogous to bilayer uh, uh, graphene. So I show a little bit about that. <laughs> this will be very brief. Um, whereas single wall nanotubes, uh, there's a uniqueness. Uh, uh, if you have uh, the 6-5 tube and you show the 6-5 tube, the Raman spectra, and you do it in one lab and you do it in another lab, you get pretty much the same spectrum. But if you do a double wall tube, that's not the case. And the reason for that is that if you take the two uh, uh, tubes, you can move them with respect to each other so the hexagons, relative positions of the hexagons change, and then you could change the chirality this way. So you have two ways to alter this uh, spectrum. So you get a range of, of, of values for any one tube. So be, be prepared for that. So uh, uh, at the conference in Bordeaux, um, uh, they had Fen Wang, and uh, he and his group have been uh, working hard to get um, uh, kind of a standard Katara plot for single wall nanotubes. And, uh, and once that's established, so if you have uh, uh, good data uh, to send to him, he's putting everybody's data together uh, and uh, taking into account environmental effects and everything else so that uh, we get some metrology going. And he's the one that's really um, uh, championed that program. So uh, uh, many of you know Fen Wang. He's a very able young professor at UC Berkeley. Um, you might want to cooperate with him because that would be very interesting. Now, with, with uh, double wall nanotubes, we have four different flavors that you can have, and the Katara plot was going to be different from all of them. So the, this, the situation gets a little bit more complicated, but Raman spectroscopy could be very useful for characterizing uh, all of these uh, different tubes. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, uh, the, the double wall tubes uh, do not quite behave. Uh, uh, if you take a 6.5 tube and it's a single wall tube and you put it inside a double wall tube, its, it's uh, spectra will change, but not that much. It, it doesn't change so much that we, can, we lose identification. You can mostly identify it, but be aware that it may change even its identity in that part of the um, uh, uh, space where you have many tubes, a high density of tubes. That's la large diameter tubes. Uh, so he here's the double wall uh, 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 tubes uh, here. So this is a bundle. And you see with the bundle, it, you have a mess. You have uh, tubes that you can't identify exactly. So you not, never know which outside tube went with which inside tube. So uh, really, spectroscopy is not possible. But if you do it at the single uh, double wall tube level, you can identify the various features. So I'm just showing you this to encourage you uh, that if you want to do spectroscopy, you have to do work at the single nanotube level. For, and OK, so that's enough, enough said on that. And um, uh, the spectrum for uh, graphene and um, nanotubes is similar, but not identical. So uh, this is a, a topic that has to be researched, and it's, I would say there's a little bit of work, but not, not a lot of work. So this is still something for a young person to uh, take on. Uh, with the double wall tubes, uh, you can uh, uh, be in a situation that the inner and outer tubes are, are resonant at different uh, uh, laser energies, like here. And working at the individual nanotube level is essential to uh, separate all of that that stuff, and um, so a few few labs uh, do that now, and uh, sometimes you're lucky, and with the same uh, laser energy, you could see both the inner and outer tube. But that's unusual, but I show you sometimes you can be lucky, and uh, uh, now people are doing triple wall tubes. And then this has gotten interesting because people are interested in trilayer graphene, so the correspondence. And you could see, I'll show you that some spectrum where we were lucky and we managed, actually, well, this, this is a triple wall tube you can see here. 
this is where the tube grows, and that's the two, two and three. And um, so here's, it's sort of, a, it looks a little bit like a mess, uh, but uh, here is the radial breathing mode on the right, and uh, this is the G band, D band region. You can see the, a lot of activity, but uh, I think triple wall tubes we'll be able to separate out and see what the shifts are. And, but I, I don't, I'm not interested in doing more than three. I think I'm going to stop at three. I think, uh, I think three is about my limit. Uh, I, I just a couple of comments about ribbons. Uh, ribbons uh, are something, and edges are something that uh, uh, are unique to, to gra well, I don't know if they're unique to graphene, but they're uh, part of graphene. And um, so there are the edges. And uh, whereas nanotubes, they can have any chirality and any angle uh, works with almost equal probability. Uh, for the, uh, I'm going to show you that the edges uh, in uh, graphene are very special. They're not, they're not like nanotubes at all. They have very great preferences. I was surprised by, by this myself, but uh, I'll show you. So this one here, the edge is zigzag and the edge here is armchair, and we label the ribbons in that way by the long edge. And you could say, in, in a sense, it would have been a little bit more symmetric if we had labeled them by the, the, the short edge, but that is the way we did it historically. I, mean, you, I won't take the time to explain why that is, but that gives you more symmetry between nanotubes and uh, uh, ribbons. But historically, we didn't do it that way, and I think we better not change now, create too much confusion. We have enough confusion with G prime. I don't, I'm not looking forward to any more confusion. So uh, here, here's armchair. You see, for, this is now uh, no spin-orbit interaction. This is our 1996 paper, very ancient. Uh, but, but you have a ribbon with four rows of carbon atoms, so we call that N equals four. Everybody uses that notation. And, you can see that's a semiconductor, and n equals five is a, is a, a, a zero gap a linear E versus K uh, ribbon, and here now we have a semiconductor again. Um, uh, zigzag is different. It, what, n four, five, and six, and anything uh, has a high density of states at the Fermi level, and that makes that one quite reactive. So the chemistry is really quite different. And when we uh, do experiments on these edges and folded edges and so forth, they really look different in the microscope. So um, we've gotten used to that. And the reason for it is, is this difference in density of states, which really pops out at you when you do the experiments. Um, so Inoki, a long time ago, started making ribbons. And uh, even before we knew how, how interesting they were. And so here's uh, an ancient ribbon. 2004. It's off the page, but it is 2004. And so you could see this is 80 nanometers, and you could see that's very small compared to 80 nanometers. So you were in, the, in, in making quantum ribbons, and uh, this is the heights. You could see that this piece here is one layer um, uh, tall. So uh, and this is uh, a monolayer uh, ribbon. And uh, this is just to show you that Raman spectroscopy uh, satisfies the selection rules as it might. And so uh, we have a ribbon sitting on graphite. So the upper frequency is uh, graphite, and that's the substrate. The ribbon um, is this one, the lower frequency. Why is it lower? You, you put a laser on it, and it's a very tiny ribbon. And even if you put a small amount of energy, it gets hot because the C-axis thermal conductivity is very poor. So it has very poor contact, so uh, it, laser energy heats it. And so uh, that's what produces the downshift. So we can tell them apart, which is nice, and then we do polarization experiment. That was predicted in 2003 to have a cosine square dependence, and the experiment gives cosine square dependence, so we were happy with that. And uh, so this tells you we can understand a little bit about ribbons, identify them with Raman, and get some 
information. So uh, other people have shown this view graph also. This is a 2004 paper that um, uh, distinguishes the D-band itself. And the D-band has an elastic process in addition to the um, inelastic process. It makes a phonon, but it also has an elastic process. So 2D would have two elastic processes. But what people call the 2D usually has no elastic processes. So it gets a little bit confusing. It makes a small difference in the frequency, if you want to be technical about it. Um, OK, so uh, this is now how to clean up the, uh, the edges, and then I'll end. Uh, so we have a, a, a TEM microscope, and we put our little piece of graphene ribbon here, and we put electrodes across so we can make IV characteristics, and we can also do jewel heating. I just want to show you. So the ribbon that, um, this is a ribbon that, that was made in Mexico in, in Mauricio Torones' group. And uh, it's over here is the ribbon. Uh, they brought it to one of the meetings and uh, showed me a picture of it. And I said, come to MIT, let's look at it. I think it'll be interesting. So we did. And so we did some jewel heating. This is the sample in the beginning. It's very, very disordered. And any, there's no clear demarcation of where the edges are here at all. And then a little bit of jewel heating starts out linear I versus V. That, so that's uh, no temperature, no heating. And then it gets nonlinear. And then at this point, the whole thing takes off and it gets extremely nonlinear. Non, non and that's when you start having motion of ions. It's about 2,000 degrees up here. We put some little particles of platinum to measure what the temperature is. And I'll show you this in, in more amplification so you could see what was happening. And so you see that this is the ribbon that we start with. And after some jewel heating, um, this, is, um, uh, this is SEM picture, so you could see low, mag mag low magnification. And here are a bunch of edges with about 20 layers. So they form arrays. That, that interests me. And the more you heat them, the more these arrays line up with a constant distance between them. And interestingly, uh, the edges are almost entirely either zigzag or armchair edges, and we don't have anything in between. So that, that is very different from the situation of nanotubes, where all the NMs uh, occur. So um, it would be nice to have more uh, data on that. The chiral ones are black, and you see very few chiral ones. And the probability of having the armchair and the zigzag is small because it's a very special orientation. But almost everything is armchair and zigzag. So uh, and, and that sort of thing doesn't happen with nanotubes. You know, we have 6.5 and 9.3 and, and, and everything else. Uh, but with um, uh, uh, graphene, graphene likes to have uh, uh, the uh, high symmetry directions. And um, theory says that in equilibrium state, the armchairs should be uh, more uh, frequent. But when you do make them with dual heating, that the zigzags seem to be uh, equally or more. So, and you can actually watch the motion of these junctions between the different kinds of edges. And we've been um, moving them and measuring the velocity uh, motion and so on. So. Um, uh, this is going back to yesterday uh, when we uh, ended our discussions. Um, what's next? We've had um, uh, graphite. We have intercalation compounds. Um, intercalation compounds have in infiltrated um, uh, graphene. People put stuff between the layers. And it's very much related to the work, early work of intercalation compounds. And it's very interesting what, what happens with graphene because you study the effect for, uh, for a bilayer, even single layer, that's sort of putting uh, surface atoms on. And um, uh, that field, I, I think, can become interesting again after not being too active for many years. And uh, uh, well, we've had fullerenes now. Fullerenes are important uh, in the energy business. And we have nanotubes um, still going. And, and graphene has taken off. And what, do, what, what are we having next? Linear chains have been uh, uh, looked at. And that hasn't turned out to be a whole lot. Uh, but uh, maybe somebody has ideas what's coming next. 
maybe we, we'll, we'll go with, with uh, Moulin's uh, little uh, 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 new molecules. That might be the next direction. I don't know. So uh, let me leave it at that and, uh, and discussion. How would you distinguish it, uh, for example, from uh, fluorescence, from hot luminescence or geminite uh, recombination? Yeah. How, how do you know that it is Raman? Or why do you, it's maybe a terminological question, but why is it Raman yeah. uh, not fluorescence if it all goes through right. real states? Yeah. That, that, that is a good question, and and, and it bothered, bothered us, too. Um, uh, time re resolution is, is one thing. Uh, how you excite it, uh, that's, we have all these different processes with it, initial, final state, and um, lifetimes. When we first first saw this, and especially when, when, it, when it, uh, for the uh, uh, monolayer and bilayer, and it's always resonant, uh, that that's troublesome. So you you think that that probably is fluorescent, but um, you know uh, time resolved uh, and intensity uh, measurements are the way we usually do these kinds of things, and that's what we did. You had a picture of these various <coughs> interfaces, zigzag and so on. Oh yeah, you want that back? Yeah. I mean, do you oh, do you want the, the one? That's right. Yeah. And you seem to have. I'll try to light them up. Yeah, well, that was nice. I don't know. <laughs> because you seem to have quite a high density of zigzag. Oh, effects. yeah, but that's because we have 20 layers. And what happens is that they break up on one layer in the next at, 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 in this ordered way. I, 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 we didn't expect that, mm -hmm. but it always does that. Right. I mean, Maybe you have a theory for it. No, not at all. But, uh, I mean, there is this theory which... Uh, it's been mentioned that the uh, zigzag edge is ferromagnetic. Uh, yeah, but that, that wouldn't show up here. You have to do magnetic measurements. Oh, I know. No, but I'm suggesting that if you could get a lot of edges, not just on the edge of ribbons, but in, in, in some more, more bulk. Well, I, I mean, your, your I mean, idea is, your idea is very good. And at, 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 at the, the next step of, of your suggestion, I'm just taking your suggestion one step further, is you can make those edges like I showed here as part of a narrow, narrow ribbon, and uh, it, the 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 um, the number of uh, rows determines whether the relation of ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic on the on the relative edges, and uh, you might have very interesting magnetic array if you did that. That's the next step of, to your idea. But you have to, to kind of arrange that. Uh, th this sample isn't exactly right. You have to cut the sample oh, yeah. to make uh, the right shape so that we get exactly what you're talking about. But that's a great idea. No, but I mean, there have, there have been mentions in obscure places in the literature of carbon samples of various types of carbon where they claim they see ferromagnetism with very high curie temperatures. No, I, mean, uh, I, mean, if, if I don't know how. They, they, they go up to 100 degrees. Or, well, I've seen uh, there are a few odd. I mean, they may not be right, but there are a few in the literature where they've got much higher ones. Not, not, in, not in graphene or something, you know, various weird samples. But I mean, uh, you know, th this would be uh, very exciting if you, if you could have something um, TC well above room temperature and. Um, <laughs> Something like that in carbon. Uh, yes, yeah. But just, uh, you asked for something this is magnetic. T this is this is a TC for superconductivity. <laughs> yeah, high TC ferromagnetism. Yeah, really right, right. Exciting. Yeah, it is. It's a good idea. But uh, nobody had. But but people have studied the mag magnetic features of the edges. Uh, the person that's done the most work on that is Hinoki in Japan. If you want to follow that in the literature. What determines the Raman shift of the peak in the electronic Raman scattering of your metallic nanotubes? Oh, well, uh, you could see that we have different Q vectors, so that's different energy required to go from the initial to the final state. So that's different wave vector and different energies. 
So that gives a very, very broad line because that, that contribution is seen over many millivolts. It's not a very strong feature. We really have to work for a long time to get that spectrum. And that's why it's been missed all these years, because it's been seen, I'm sure, by many people, but they, do, they weren't looking for it. So I think you mentioned that you introduced acetonitrile, and there was another molecule to dope the nanotubes, and look, you uh, showed the Raman spectra for that. I wondered whether there was any signature of the uh, dopant molecules themselves, which oh, come out or yeah. enhanced by the nanotube. Uh, very good question. Uh, you have to work at that. Uh, when we were doing intercalation compounds, the one compound that we used to see very good spectra for the intercalin, that is the species that you put on, uh, was bromine. I, I don't know why that one worked so much better, but there were other uh, uh, molecules like ferric chloride that we had a huge ton of data, and we never got this, the vibrations of, of that molecule. And I, I, I don't have a theory, theoretical explanation why bromine is so wonderful. But bromine doesn't do stage one, and I, I, I don't really understand that either. It, it only starts working on stage two. Uh, and, uh, and it's the only one, only in Turkulin, that I know that has that characteristic. So, so, yeah, so I, w I just wonder whether there might be the any... shift. The shift is, is amazingly huge. Uh, uh, the vibrational frequency goes from something like 300 to 200 wave numbers. I mean, that's uh, uh, almost unheard of shift in Raman spectroscopy. There, there are some molecules where the uh, absorbed molecule uh, Raman signature is very strongly enhanced by graphene. Oh, yeah, that's another I thing I forgot that, so to the, talk the, about. Is there any connection between the nanotube work and the graphene work? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, graphene is um, uh, it's called GERS. I, I, that's what you're referring to. Uh, there's a, a phenomenon called SIRS, Surface Enhanced Raman Scattering, uh, which will, enha will enhance the signal uh, of a molecule by many orders of magnitude, 10 orders of magnitude. It's a, a huge effect. With uh, GERS, this is a, a graphene substrate, the enhancement is less than one order of magnitude, but it's very large. So uh, that is to say, let me repeat, because maybe not everybody knows about this phenomenon. This is something pretty new. If you take a graphene surface and you put, say, a molecule sitting on the graphene surface, the spectrum of the Raman spectrum of the molecule will go way up in intensity. But it doesn't do it by many orders of magnitude. It does it by maybe a factor of a, a few. But that's a lot. So, I mean, it's very, very noticeable. And uh, the, the work on that, the best, most complete work, is done in Beijing. But anybody can do it. It's a very direct experiment.